This talk will be about the EAT ICU trial, the Early Goal Directed Nutrition in ICU Patients trial. My name is Matilda Jo Ellingstrup, and I worked as the coordinating investigator on the trial that was carried out at the Department of Intensive Care, Copenhagen University Hospital, Rieshospital in Denmark. In this talk, I'll briefly touch upon the background for why we wanted to do the trial. I'll go over the design and the methods we applied on the trial. I'll go over the results with you. And lastly, I'll conclude. The EDICU trial was funded primarily by Rieshospital and Copenhagen University Hospital, but it was also supported by Fresenius Carby, MedGraphics, COSMED and ESPEN, the European Society of Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism. None of these supporting agencies had any influence in relation to design of the trial, conduct of the trial, or in analysis and interpretation of the data. The EAT ICU trial was published in September 2017 in Intensive Care Medicine. This first slide I'm going to show you illustrates one of the major problems that our ICU patients face after being admitted to the ICU. It's been nicely documented that our patients lose up to 20% body mass during a typical ICU admission of 10 days. What you see in the bottom part of the slide is a CT scan of a thigh of a patient in septic shock. Your left hand side of the slide is at baseline day zero and the right hand slide is day seven of septic shock. The muscle wasting is very visible. We know that this muscle wasting comes from a combination of immobilization, sedation, neuromuscular blockers, inflammation, infection and insufficient nutrition therapy. However, we do not know whether giving an optimized nutrition therapy could prevent some of this loss of lean body mass. When patients discharged from the ICU are asked about their quality of life, they state that they have a reduced quality of life, a reduced physical quality of life, and when asked why, they all say that Reduced quality, physical quality of life comes from reduced physical function and loss of muscle mass. So when looking at evidence in relation to optimized nutrition therapy, there's actually still a lot we don't know. We're still discussing the root. Should we give patients enteral nutrition? Should we give patients parental nutrition? Or should we give patients a combination of the two? What about the timing? I think we largely agree that we want to give patients early enteral nutrition, but when is it the optimal timing to start supplementary parental nutrition? Should we do it early or should we do it later in the ICU admission? Requirements, we're still discussing whether to give a little protein or much more protein. We're still discussing uh, energy requirements as well. When we started writing the protocol for the eat ICU trial, one of the biggest trials in nutrition history had just been published. The EPANIC trial included 4,600 critically ill patients and randomized them to receive either an early or a late supplementary parental nutrition. The early group had supplementary parental nutrition within 48 hours from ICU admission whereas the late group had supplementary parental nutrition from day eight of ICU admission. This trial failed to find a difference in mortality between the two groups. However, they did find that patients randomized to the late supplementary parental nutrition, that was the patients who received parental nutrition at day eight, were more likely to be discharged alive, to have fewer infections, complications, and need for life support. The same year, in 2011, the Tikakos pilot trial was um, published. This trial randomized 
130 critically ill patients to receiving either standard of care or liberal parental nutrition based on measurements of indirect calorimetry. In this trial, they were able to find a trend towards mortality and mortality reduction for the patients who were randomized to receiving the liberal parental nutrition. However, this group also experienced a longer length of mechanical ventilation, a longer duration of mechanical ventilation, and they also had to stay longer in the ICU. A few, later, a few years later, the SPN trial was published in The Lancet. Uh, this trial randomized 305 critically ill mechanically ventilated patients to receiving either standard of care or supplementary parental nutrition given from day three based on measurements of indirect calorimetry. In this trial, they were again not able to find a difference in mortality between the groups. However, the patients randomized to receiving the supplementary parental nutrition on day three had fewer infections compared to patients randomized to standard of care. This led us to want to do a rather ambitious trial, focusing primarily on answering the question, can early goal-directed nutrition improve physical quality of life through a reduced loss of muscle mass? But we also wanted to address one of the hot topics in ICU nutrition at the moment. We wanted to look at whether we could come a step closer to answering the question of the optimal protein dosing for our patients. We also wanted to see if we could address the question of finding the optimal time of initiation of supplementary parental nutrition. And lastly, we wanted to see how our patients would tolerate this early goal-directed nutrition therapy. So we designed a single center parallel group, single-blinded, randomized control trial. In this trial, we included acutely admitted ICU patients and we randomized them one-to-one -to, -one to receiving either early goal-directed nutrition therapy or to standard of care. We performed a power calculation showing that we needed to include 200 critically ill ICU patients in our trial. We wanted to include patients within 24 hours from ICU admission and we wanted to design broad inclusion criteria in order to get as many patients as possible, but we also wanted to include the sickest patients. So we included patients who were adult, above 18 years of age. We included patients who were acutely admitted. We wanted to give nutrition therapy as quickly as possible after admission. We included patients who were expected to stay in the ICU longer than three days because we wanted to be able to give nutrition over a nice long time span. We included patients who were mechanically ventilated so we could perform indirect calorimetry. And we included patients who also had a central line so we could give parental nutrition. The intervention group, the group receiving the early goal-directed nutrition, had energy requirements calculated, or I'm sorry, estimated using measurements of indirect calorimetry, and they had protein requirement defined using uh, measurements of 24-hour urinary urea excretions. However, we applied at least 1.5 grams of protein per kilo body weight per day. In this group, we aimed at giving 100, covering 100% of energy and protein requirements from very early in the admission from day one. And we did this using both enteral nutrition and parental nutrition. For the control group, the standard of care group, we initiated enteral nutrition as early as possible within 24 hours from admission as recommended by the ESPEN guidelines. We gradually increased the central nutrition as tolerated by the patient over the first few days of admission and we gave nutrition we gave energy based on calculated goals we then supplemented with parental nutrition only from day eight we chose 
that our primary outcome measure should be physical quality of life at six months. This was assessed using the physical component summary score, the PCS score, from the quality of life questionnaire called SF36. In the period from 2013 to 2016, we screened just short of 600 patients, and out of these 600 patients, we randomized 203 patients. These patients were then randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either standard of care or early goal-directed nutrition. For both groups, we were not able to obtain SF36 for respectively 11 and 12 patients. However, using the statistical method called multiple imputation, we were able to gain a full data set for all of our patients. This slide shows you the baseline characteristics of the patients randomized to respectively the early goal-directed nutrition group and the standard of care group. What you'll see when looking at the slide is that patients did not differ in relation to age, sex, actual body weight, BMI, SAPS2 score, which is a score we use to say something about severity of illness, or SOFA score, number of organ failing. This slide shows you nutrition variables between the two groups. You will see that energy balances and protein balances were different between the two groups. The early goal-directed nutrition group had less negative energy balances and less negative protein balances. In relation to protein intake, we were able to achieve just short of 1.5 grams of protein per kilo body weight per day in the early goal-directed nutrition group compared with only 0.5 grams of protein per kilo body weight per day in the standard of care group. A difference of 1 grams per kilo body weight per day between the two groups. When looking at plasma urea, the early goal-directed group had higher values compared to the standard of care group, which also held true for 24-hour urinary urea excretion. This slide shows you the mean daily protein and energy intake per trial day 1 to 7. On the top part of the slide, you'll see the daily protein intake for the two groups. The blue line represents the early goal-directed nutrition group and the red line represents the standard of care group. You'll see we achieved a nice difference between the two groups in terms of mean daily protein intake. On the bottom part of the slide, you will see the same graph for the daily energy intake. Again, the blue line represents the early goal-directed nutrition group and the red line represents the standard of care group. Again, we were able to achieve a difference in mean energy intake per day, 1 to 7. Coming now to the results of our primary outcome measure, the physical component summary score, the physical quality of life at 6 months. We were not able to find any relative or absolute difference in PCS score between the early goal-directed nutrition group and the standard of care group. This slide shows the secondary outcome measures of the trial. Vital status, we were not able to find any statistically significant differences between groups in terms of death at day 28, day 90, or at six months. We were also not able to find any statistically significant differences in terms of length of stay in ICU or in hospital. So hospital between the two groups. Percentage of days life without life support using renal replacement therapy, mechanical ventilation, or inotrope vasopressor support did also not differ significantly between the two groups. Time to new organ failure did not reach statistical significance between the two groups. Number of patients having a new organ failure in the ICU or new use of renal re 
placement therapy in the ICU, differences did not reach statistical significance. For time to any infection, the differences did not reach statistical significance, and that also held true for any nosocomial infection. And for the mental component summary score from the SF36 questionnaire. However, we did find statistically significant differences between the two groups. We found that patients randomized to early goal directed nutrition had a higher need for insulin. And we also found that patients randomized to this early goal directed nutrition group had more episodes of hyperglycemia defined as a hyper as a blood sugar above 15 millimoles per liter. This slide shows you survival over time in the two groups. And as you'll see, we did not find any difference between the two groups. This brings me to my final slide, the conclusion. We ended up concluding that the early goal-directed nutrition did not appear to affect physical quality of life at six months or other important outcomes as compared to standard care nutrition in acutely admitted mechanically ventilated adult ICU patients. Thank you so much for listening.